This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. We are in the very middle of dramatic changes and transitions, which challenge our very sense of happiness today. What can we turn to to deal with the ever-increasing unpredictability and helplessness? With a long civilization stretching 5,000 years, Chinese today go back to history to seek answers. For example, from Confucius, one of the most respected ancient Chinese philosophers, who tried to provide some answers to his time, the Warring States period, one of the most unstable periods in Chinese history. David Moser, a linguist and a sinologist, who began his research on China in the 1980s, is eager to discuss that with me. While we took a stroll in Shichahai, one of the most tranquil places in downtown Beijing in the early autumn days. This is also what many the so-called the ancient noblemen, you know, the royal families also consider as their best place to stay. You know, but what does this has to do with China's traditional understanding of happiness, of a happy life? Maybe this is a crystallization of that. But if we think about Confucius, how is he describing happiness? Confucius, uh, by contrast to the kinds of de definitions of happiness we have in the West, Confucian, Confucian uh, philosophy sees happiness as a sort of a, co a collective phenomenon. The fact that happiness, we are defined by uh, the groups that we are in, the, our family, uh, the societies that we live in, the, the, the companies that we uh, are part of, and, and our relationships with those groups and the people that we deal with on an everyday basis are what not only defines us, but also brings us gratification, a self of self-fulfillment, and, and happiness. It's very interesting because there are a lot of words related to happiness. Desire, pleasure, right. hedonism, mm -hmm. and the list goes on. So, um, but to Confucius, it's none of those words alone, mm. but rather much more different, actually, from that way of seeking individualism. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, is one of the f features that sort of contrast the Confucian notion of a, of a good life with a sort of Western notion of a good life. So for, for Confucius, um, this notion of happiness is not merely a, ma a matter of uh, physical, sensual pleasure or of attraction or things like food, sex, and so on. But to, to live the good life is, is a more of a, of a holistic kind of, a, a, a kind of a situation where uh, you live in conjunction with other human beings and the sense of self is broader. So whereas a, a Western society see the unit of culture as being the individual, and so the, individual, the, individual, the individual's freedom, the individual's autonomy, and the individual's ability to pursue the life that, that means something to them is paramount. Uh, Confucius saw the basic unit of society as the family. And in fact, the family, a healthy family and a cultured family was, was essential to the functioning of the state. Yeah. And so, in, in other words, the feeling of, of what the good life would be is not one of self-fulfillment, but of the total fulfillment of all those connections in your life. Sounds easy to explain, isn't it, David? I mean, you came to China in the 1980s, you stay here for decades doing Chinese uh, characters and also um, cultural research. I really wonder what is this gradual understanding process for you to understand China's way or Confucius way of describing happiness? Well, in fact, w one of the first few uncomfortable moments that I've had in China when I came here in the 1980s was this awareness of the individual mindset versus the group mindset. So for example, I would be with some friends and go in and buy some, some chewing gum in the store. And I would come out and I would start chewing the, chewing the chewing gum and people would look at me like, what's this? You go in the store and buy chewing gum, you're not, giving, you're not sharing it with the others, right? It never occurred to me, this was, I needed chewing gum, this was to fulfill my needs and gratification. I didn't think, wait a minute, I'm part of this group that has the same kinds of needs and same kind of desires. I should take them into account when I go buy something for me that they might want to partake in it also. And this was a lesson for me as someone from America and I began to realize this is a, a failing of our own culture that we tend to emphasize our own gratification without thinking of other people. It's very interesting to see the trend in 
uh, studies around the world about Confucius and Confucianism. It's not just about looking at it as a philosophy, philosophical thought, but rather uh, coming from a cross-cultural perspective and also cross-subjects uh, perspective, how it would be relevant today. Probably one of the biggest influences of Confucianism now in the West, as people are being to, to reimagine it, are certain kind of cross-cultural studies. Moral philosophy is a very hot topic right now. And part of the reason for that is we're, we're uh, experiencing this conflict in the West, and particularly in the United States, with opposing forces on two sides that have different moral systems. If you look is at issues like abortion, if you look at issues like capital punishment, at issues like uh, racism and so forth, there's, and even religion, which is a big hot topic, there's this, there's this, there's this notion of how do we see these uh, moral issues spelled out in a society where we have to reach some kind of consensus. And this is not something that a lot of Western philosophy and West, Western uh, frameworks have a good handle on. We tend to th see people as maximize the happiness of the individual and all the other things will fall into place. And we're finding out that that is not absolutely not the case. Maximizing the happiness of the individual re results in schisms, in conflicts, in, in, and uh, just an absolutely unmendable conflicts that lead, lead to, to violent conflict and, out, and war. So people are now trying to study how is a different way to, uh, what, is, what is a more optimal way of, a, of ordering a society that starts from different principles and that starts from a basic kind of a ritual, ritualistic shows of goodwill uh, that can, first of all, set the tone for a sort of a, um, a sort of peaceful kind of collaboration and compromise, which is so important in ritual, right? A lot of it is compromising your own uh, status, your, your sense of self-worth, and so in, for the benefit of the other person. Remember, you were telling me also stories about your shifu, your master, right? Uh, when you were trying to learn the Chinese crosstalk as a way to practice your language and also as a way to understand the Chinese culture. And Mr. Jing Guangquan, in fact, give you a lot of different ways of understanding what is happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, describe that to me also. Yes, actually, Ding Wangqian was, was a great, uh, not only a, a crosstalk performer, but a, a great teacher and a moral teacher. Uh, so in addition to teaching us just the, the techniques of, of crosstalk and xiangzheng, he would also teach us things like respect for elders and what, the, what a teacher means. And one of the ways he did this, he would talk about his relation to Hou Baolin, and he would talk about what that entailed and, and, and the importance of a, of, a, of a master who you study at the, at the feet of, and the, the parallels to the parents. So on, on, you, have to remember, you should remember their birthdays, you should always give them gifts, you should also consider them. When you, if you leave Beijing, you should tell them so they know where you are, right? So, it's, so, so it, was, it was sort of like, for us, we think of, oh, this is a, uh, a teacher-student relationship. For us in the West, that's kind of a contractual relationship or a temporary relationship. When I leave, I'm through, and I may see the teacher again or I may not. For, for Ding Guangxian, he was telling us, no, these relationships are part of your life now. You are defined by being Ding Guangxian's student, and so you must always remember that. Put him in your articles, talk about him, and also treat him as a member of the family. And so, for me, that was quite a realization that he saw this as more than just individuals getting together and cooperating. Once we're together, we're family, or we're a unit, and we're a collective, and we should think of ourselves as, as part of that unit. People will say, well, what you said, it seems to be familiar to me. Is that about individualism versus uh, collectivism? In fact, in fact, this is the core of it. It's this individualism versus collectivism. Uh, and people have found out part of the happiness and the good life is part of the sacrifice and sharing the hardship with others. After all, we are um, social animals. We evolved to be, to have contact and to, to have our lessons, our life lessons be taught by these people around us. And so uh, you can see it in people's faces. If someone, if you help someone and they're happy, look at the face of the person who helped them. They are just as happy as the one who got helped. Look at grandparents taking care of their grandkids. The happiest thing in the world is when their grandchildren are happy. And that's something we lose sight of in a, in a sort of collective uh, of mentality. Talking about happiness, 
and the so-called individualism versus collectivism. You see research in the West flourishing about Confucius, Confucius version of happiness. And that also gives some kinds of uh, a, a different layer of thought to the psychological studies mm -hmm. that people are doing these right. days. Right. You see those popular classes online, for example, from Harvard universities and others, trying to describe how ancient philosophy could be of use for us today yeah. in terms of happiness. Can you help us to understand more about that trend? Okay. Yes, in fact, you know, one of the most popular courses at Harvard right now is a course in Chinese philosophy. They have hundreds of students take the course and, and they say it changes their life. And one of, the, one of the aspects of Confucianism that's hardest to convey for a lot of students is this notion of ritual. Confucius' notion of ritual was, was a, total, a, a totalistic sort of notion of ritual. And in fact, his realization is something that's, that's helping a lot of uh, foreigners in the West develop a better uh, sort of uh, system of explaining morality. Of, of the moral system of, of, of humankind. And that ritual is a part of it. If you stop and think about it, everything in your life is ritual, is, a, is accompanied by ritual. We think of ritual like someone saluting a soldier or, or, you know, ritual bowing. But actually, the way you use your body in everyday life and the way you use your, your face and your head all convey this connect the different kinds of connectedness that we have. You remember in the, in the Confucius classics, they talk a lot about how, how the what how the master sat, how he placed his mat, how he drank his tea, and so forth. These are not little things. So, for example, how we use our heads. If I'm talking to you on the internet, you can't really see this. But when we're talking here, if I say um, if I say Tenway, did you send me that file that you were supposed to the other day? I'm pointing a finger at you and I'm looking right at you, and yeah, it's I almost it. like it's almost like I'm a superior, right? If I'm saying, uh, Tenway, did, did you send me that file that I asked for the other day? My head is bowed, and I'm expressing either equality or a kind of a subservience to you, which can make negotiate the, the connection between us and make it very clear. One of the reasons we're so unhappy now is we're doing all these interactions online where you can't see the ritual gestures, the pat on the back, the hug, sometimes the, this kind of thing. It helps how he said, that's very good, it's correct, but it's, it's augmented when I say, it. that's very good, that's correct. There's a kind of a happy, you know, dopamine rush when you get this, right? The reason we're so unhappy is we can't express these ritual expressions of, of our relationship and our connectedness online. So much of the frustration and unhappiness and misery that we are feeling now collectively in the, a part of the whole world is the fact that we don't have this ritual connection that is in everything and all connections in all of our uh, relationships in everyday life. And it makes us feel less than a full person. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Very pleasure.